Hello and welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. So today we have City Councilor Rob Consalvo here, and he's going to talk to us about the issues of importance to you around education and public safety and housing and the economy and jobs. But he's also running for mayor of Boston. And so listen closely because he's going to tell you why you should consider seriously giving him your vote to be the next mayor of this great city. Bobby? Thanks for coming on. I'm glad to be here, Sheriff. I really appreciate it. I know you guys are all over the place, you know, and so, you know, parceling out a little time for us is great, and so I'll get right to it. Talk to us and talk to the viewers about where you stand on education. So the, the issue of education is a personal issue for me. Uh, I have three children, Amanda, Anthony, and Austin, who are 10, 9, and 3, and I'm grateful that uh, Amanda and Anthony go to the Boston Public Schools. They're at the Roosevelt. And uh, with sibling preference, Austin will join them. So when I'm mayor of this city, and I'm leading not just the city but our public schools, I'll actually have three kids matriculating through the system. So it makes it a personal issue. Mm -hmm. I call it the ultimate check and balance when you are trusting your own children's future with the very system you're chosen to lead. Uh, so for me, um, I'm going to make public education a number one priority, not just for my kids, but for all 55,000 kids in the Boston public schools. Uh, we're going to work to make sure that there's equal access and equal opportunity for every kid. Um, one of the things that I want to do is make sure that our regular ed kids uh, are in our school system with their counterparts who have special needs and that we're going to invest in our kids who have special needs. I think it's one of the real tragedies of, of public education in our public schools. We need to invest in special needs kids and we need to invest in our English language learners. Two groups that uh, need attention and that we need to make sure we're also investing in the wraparound services that these kids need as well uh, in some of these lower performing schools. Um, we want the special needs kids and the ELL kids to have the same access to the resources and opportunities as the regular ed kids. And we want them learning side by side and having the same opportunity. So I'm going to be committed to addressing that as mayor. Uh, one of the things I'm going to address is um, the issue of our school buildings. We need a long-term capital plan that we're going to invest in our buildings so that they're all state-of-the-art facilities, not just certain schools that are state-of-the-art facilities. The kids in the Boston Public Schools deserve the very best when it comes to our facilities. And we, uh, you look at a suburban school system, uh, they all have state-of-the-art facilities. Well, the kids in Boston deserve no less. So we're going to invest in our buildings and have a long-term plan to make all of the Boston Public Schools state-of-the-art facilities. What do you think about a longer school day? Are you in favor of lengthening the school day and maybe shortening the, the time the kids are out of school during summer vacation? I do ex uh, support an extended learning day. Uh, I think there should be choice in the schools about how that operates. should not be dictated from Court Street that uh, we should engage the school communities about what they want in their extended learning day. And that discussion's not happening with a lot of folks. I think it should be. I think we should give choice back to the schools to talk about how they're extending learning day and what it's going to look like and what it means. And extending learning day can mean so many things. It can mean citizen schools. It could mean educational or arts opportunities. And we need to give flexibility to parents who have special circumstances um, that relate to their children uh, who are doing their own extended learning time outside of the school. They should be able to, in certain cases, get credit for that as well. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm all in favor of it. We need to negotiate it and make it happen in our city and find the resources to get it done. Should, uh, would you, once you're mayor, if you become mayor, would you have an elected school board or would you have an appointed school board? I support the appointed school board. Uh, I just think that, you know, we need to take the politics out of the uh, public schools. The, the school committee sends their budget to the city council anyway. So w when they pass it, it's not even the law. They have to send it to the city council to us. And so there's a real check and balance there with your elected city councilors who have final say on the budget for parents who are concerned that they don't have a voice. We, we work with the school department in changing that budget every year when it comes over to reflect priorities that we hear from our constituents. And so there, there already is the political opportunity for parents and neighborhood groups to weigh in on it. That's when the council gets it. I say we keep the appointed school board, which clearly has made great progress in our schools. Of course we have much more work to do. But at the same time, our graduation rates are the highest they've ever been. Our dropout rate is the lowest it's ever been. There are more people choosing the Boston Public Schools. Our enrollment is an all-time high. So let's continue the progress and the work that an appointed board has done. Let's take the politics out of it. And let's let folks who can focus on education and not running for re-election. As mayor, how would you work with the Boston Teachers Union? Well, I think that, you know, look, I, I have utmost respect for public school teachers and the teachers union. And I got news for those folks out there who don't want to work with the union. They're not going anywhere. They're going to be there. Whether I'm mayor now or in 100 years, they're still going to be there, unless somehow a special bill gets passed to eliminate them. So it doesn't make sense to have a confrontational relationship with the teachers union. Whoever is mayor, it's going to require negotiation. It's going to require a cooperative approach to governing. I got a motto. I want to let cooperation replace confrontation because I think more gets done when people work together. 
This is a historic opportunity for the next mayor to come in and have a proactive working relationship with the union that negotiates real reforms, that negotiates real advancements for our school, teaches, uh, treats teachers with respect and gives them the health and benefits and salary that they deserve, and at the same time is uh, good for our city. I find it insulting to say we can't get there through collective bargaining, that no mayor can negotiate with the union and get the real reforms necessary. I think a mayor can. I think Rob Consalvo will. And I think I'm just the guy they're looking for to treat them with the respect that they deserve. Doesn't mean we won't disagree. Doesn't mean I won't have a different vision that may require some cantankerous and controversial negotiations. But at the end of the day, it's about respect. And I think that as a mayor, I'll be the one who can sit at the table and get the real reforms done that respect it's t respect teachers. It's time to end this divisive debate where we're pitting the union against the mayor, the union against Court Street, charters against the union, kids against kids. It's got to end. It's not what the public wants, and it doesn't, I, I think, lead to real progress in our city. And with that said, the final question in the education category, what would you be looking for, what qualities would you be looking for in your school commissioner? So I think school the, superintendent. Yep, the next superintendent... Um, for me, it's going to have to have a lot of qualities. It's going to have to be an innovator, uh, someone who's willing to think outside the box. It's going to have to be someone who's willing to work and has experience and understands the challenges urban school districts face. I also believe that the union and parents need to have a seat at the table in terms of moving uh, progress forward in our Boston Public Schools. So I, I'm going to want a superintendent who's a listener, who's going to be willing to not shut out uh, not shut out people in the community who want a seat at the table. I know when I go to my own kids' school for parent-teacher conferences and arts night and movie night and all the things we do at our BPS school, parents have want a voice and parents should have a real voice in the school system. I'm not afraid to look at a non-traditional superintendent, somebody that may not just bounce around from school system to school system. There's a trend out there that other cities are looking at non-traditional superintendents, folks who have management skills and, and negotiating skills and a vision of innovation. We shouldn't be afraid to look outside the box at non-traditional superintendents either. That's something I'm willing to look at. And I would just say, I know you said it was a final question, but I want to get into one important sure, piece. Please. I want to make every school in the city a K-8 that wants to be. I think the number one way you can immediately address quality in your school and get back to neighborhood school and ensure that uh, folks have a quality school in the neighborhood is getting rid of the system of K-5. through five. We, we put parents through a cumbersome assignment pro policy in K-1. We put them through it again in K-5. Mm -hmm. We ripped them out of a school that they like, where they have friends and connections, and now we put them somewhere else in a school they probably didn't choose to start all over again. Let's make every school a K through eight. Let's give parents that 10 years of predictability that they crave. Let's give them the opportunity to become invested in their school for 10 years. And let's uh, have a long-term approach to making all the schools a K through eight in our city, not just the ones who are most politically connected or the schools that yell the loudest. Every school should be the K to K if they want to be. Let's talk about public safety. Where do you stand on public safety? I'm for it. What do you need no, to I'm do? No, that's no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <He's mobbing>. uh, <laughs> um, Just recently, I put forth a public safety plan that uh, has been called the most comprehensive of all the plans that the candidates put out. It's a four-pronged attack. It's prevention, intervention, enforcement, and technology. Okay. My plan calls for hiring in my first term 200 new police officers. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're only putting police officers on to cover the attrition rate. And while we're the, one of the safest cities in the country, that's not going to hold the line in a city that's growing in population. Our last census showed our numbers increased. Uh, our innovation district is exploding with new people every day. And just the other day, I met with a developer who's going to develop uh, four or five parcels that will bring in 9,000 new people to the mm. innovation district. We need to grow our force that can cover the increase in our population that would add more police officers to our neighborhood police stations like E18 and High Park and E5 and West Rock Rock and everywhere. We need a slow incremental growth so we strengthen our force for community policing, more officers on bikes, foot patrols, and in the car. And we need to do it in a responsible way. I phase it in over five years because it would be about a $20 million investment. But if we do it over, I'm sorry, four years. If we do it over four years, that's a $5 million appropriation each year. More than responsible in a $2.6 billion budget. And so that's one aspect of it. We need to do a 15% increase in our summer jobs. We need to pick up the slack that where the state and federal government has walked away from summer jobs. The city council and the mayor have fully funded summer jobs every year. Let's grow that number because we know that the best way to keep kids out of trouble is put money in their pocket and give them stability of a job where they learn skills that will help them all the way through their life. I also think we need to be creating, uh, addressing two particular issues in our city that I've called for in my plan that gets extra special attention with full-time resources and a full-time staff uh, on two areas. Reducing gun violence in our city. It needs its own dedicated group of uh, police officers, civilian folks, neighborhood leaders, and outside folks who have a lot of understanding and skills on that to focus on reducing gun violence in our city and also violence against women and girls. 
So we're gonna, my plan, I call for carving out two separate offices that will work full time addressing those two issues in our city. We need to do better with probation. So the people that are coming back when they leave your place and they're coming back into the city of Boston, we shouldn't just rely on the state probation officers who do yeoman's work of solving that issue. I'm calling for the creation of a probation office right in the police department that really works to help the folks who are in the neighborhoods. Let the Boston police who know the neighborhoods better than anybody uh, be in there making sure that we're providing services and job training and reentry services for these folks so that we can make sure they don't revert back to a life of crime. I want to go back to the gun control issue. Uh, since the marathon bombings, I think we've had somewhere around 100 or 105 shootings, almost one a day since that. Um, now, I know that you're, you, you, you've been very uh, a loud voice for gun control and how this situation or this issue of guns uh, coming into the city and being utilized by our, our citizens have had an adverse effect. Talk to me more about that and some of the things that you have already done around the issue of gun control. Sure, I, I think that technology, this is where technology can come in and play a huge role in helping us reduce gun violence in our city and stopping firearms from coming into our city. First off, I was proud to bring ShotSpotter to our city. Uh, acoustic gunshot technology that captures the sound of gunfire and links it directly to 911 within three seconds so that our dispatchers know the exact geographic address of a shooting when it's happening. We're dispatching police cars to the shot spotter locations minutes before a single person calls 911 and we've linked it to EMS so that they're responding as well. We need a citywide expansion of shot spotter so that it's in every neighborhood because there's no neighborhood that has escaped from gun violence sadly and we need to use cameras a responsible integration of cameras into the shot spotter system. I'm not looking to uh, create a police state or a big brother state, but we could be using strategic cameras strategically and linking them to shot spotter. And what that means is we now have the technology, if we were to use cameras, and, and shot spotter has a technology where we could link the two so that if a shot spotter sensor picked up a shooting over here, the camera would turn to where the shooting is happening and actually capture the shooting and the incident live on camera. We should be doing that in our city to protect our neighborhoods hardest hit by gun violence. I've called for and sent three letters to Smith & Wesson, for, called for them to undertake a new technology uh, that would allow for a GPS or a low jack style chip to be installed in handguns. The technology exists, it's been patented, and not one gun company will take on the challenge of putting this in their firearms because of their fear uh, of their customers. Fact of the matter is, one of the ways that guns come into our city is guns that have been stolen at homes, cars, gun shows or gun stores. If you had a tracking technology that could only be activated by the gun owner, the minute their gun was stolen, they'd be able to notify the police and have that tracking technology activated. Just like LoJack, that when someone's car is stolen, they activate the LoJack and the police find where the car is. We'd be able to eliminate hundreds of guns coming into our city every year if the gun companies would uh, undertake this technology. Now, obviously, as a mayor, I can't legislate that, but what I can do is use the bully pulpit of the mayor and the city council to try and make them and force them into doing that. I've sent three letters to Smith & Wesson. They have not responded to one of them. Talking about using the bully pulpit, I have far too many people in my facilities that should be in a detox bed or a mental health bed. What would you do as mayor to address that situation also? It's one of the number one issues, and I'm particularly glad you addressed the mental health piece. It's time for a serious conversation in the city about mental health services, both as it relates to drugs and alcohol, but even in our Boston public schools and providing the services with kids who need our help the most who may have emotional or mental health issues. We're not doing it. We need to. It would be a priority for me. And the issue of substance abuse is we know one of the main fuelers of uh, gang and drug violence and some of the poor decisions people make that lead them to a life of crime. So as mayor, I'm going to be committed to through our public health commission and through other avenues.